Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of my live series of pet. Wait a minute. Do you guys feel that? Oh my, I don't feel so good. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Oh! It's the Halloween episode! So, I brought my little buddies along today and we are going to have that kind of stroll. Welcome to episode number 66, or should I say episode 666, because it is almost Halloween here in Paris, and I thought that we would do a thematic episode and get really, really dark and nasty. This is the episode that I'm calling The Weird, The Wicked, and The Wolves. And we are at a famous spot here. All right, I'm playing with my toys a little bit. So hopefully that gets you in the mood and they'll be joining us on the tour today. So let's jump right into it because I've got a lot of really great stuff to show you. Happy Halloween to all of you if you're watching around Halloween. And if you're not, well, it's Halloween where I am. So happy Halloween to you. We're at the La Tour Saint-Jacques, which is a, um, a bell tower of a church that dates back to 1509. And we're going to jump right in with some of the darker, uh, more bizarre stories. And let's get going with the story of alchemy. For those of you who aren't familiar, who need a sort of a catch up on what alchemy is, um, it dates back to ancient Egypt. It was a mixture of science, mythology, and magic that claimed if you combined in your laboratory a precise combination of metals and other elements um, at precise temperatures, you could create something called the Philosopher's Stone. Um, it would give you two things if you were able to create the Philosopher's Stone. You'd have the power to transform any metal into gold, which would make you extraordinarily rich, and it would also offer you everlasting life, immortality. So for thousands of years, people were seeking and trying to figure out the secrets of how, how do we create the Philosopher's Stone, and that is the search um, of the alchemists. Now, if you're a Harry Potter fan at all, the Philosopher's Stone might sound familiar to you because it was the title of the very first book except if you read it in the U.S. where they changed the Philosopher's Stone title to the Sorcerer's Stone for fear that the word philosopher would scare away American readers. So not, not much of a vote of confidence for American intelligence. They switched philosopher to sorcerer. But anyway, it's supposed to be the Philosopher's Stone. And that story, Harry Potter, that first book, references a famous Parisian, an alchemist who, whose name was uh, Nicolas Flamel. And Nicolas, Nicolas Flamel was an actual real person who lived here in the Middle Ages, just steps from where we are. So let me show you uh, Nicolas Flamel, Nicolas, as he would be called in French. I even brought a light. So I'm going to turn on the light and I'm going to show you. This is good looking dude, right? Nicolas Flamel. He was living here in the 14th and 15th centuries, just steps from where we are. In fact, the street that I'm on right now is named the Rue Nicolas Flamel and it intersects with the street named after his wife, Pernel. And he was practicing this ancient art, so he claimed, of alchemy. Look at this. There is a classic alchemist in his laboratory. So, back to Flamel. It's 1382, and all of a sudden Flamel comes into a huge amount of money. And he was investigated by the king's men, men and he claimed that he had cracked the code of the Philosopher's Stone, and he was manufacturing gold in his own home. Well, the news spread like wildfire, and obsessed believers often broke into Flamel's home when he wasn't, a, when he wasn't around uh, to look for the stone. They would look for his book of recipes in his, in his basement. They'd even dig up soil from his basement and take it home and test it for traces of gold. So we're gonna I'm going to turn off my lamp here. I got my bike. I got a whole production, and we're going to get a little bit closer. So what does all that have to do with, it, with the La Tour Saint-Jacques here in the heart of Paris? Well, this tower used to be attached to a church, and the church housed uh, the tomb of Flamel. When he died, grave robbers tore open his tomb looking to steal the Philosopher's Stone. Maybe it was buried with him, or the secrets of alchemy. And when they opened up the tomb, rumor has it that the grave was empty. There was no corpse at all. So perhaps Flamel had in fact created the Philosopher's Stone right here in the heart of Paris and had attained immortality. But it doesn't stop there. Before he died, he paid to help redecorate the church that was attached to La Tour Saint-Jacques with huge donations of money. And they claim that he perhaps embedded the secrets of alchemy, the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone into the carvings of the church. Well, the French Revolution did away with the church, but the tower remains and it begs the question, did Nicolas Flamel here actually give us the secrets hidden in plain sight, the secrets of alchemy and the Philosopher's Stone? And if he in fact discovered it, he may be immortal and still walking around the streets of Paris some 600 years later. 
So let's check with uh, let's check with this guy and see if he thinks it's. He says yes. He confirms that the legend is true. So let's get on the move here. This tower is an absolute gem. It's the perfect way to start this sort of spooky episode, this Halloween episode. And I'm going to hop on my bike and we're going to hit the road. Welcome to a nocturnal bike ride through your favorite city. If anyone can spot Nicolas Flamel, 600 and something years old, you let me know. We might just catch him on video here. If you're just joining, this is episode number 66 of my series, although we're calling it number 666, Halloween themed episode. It's the weird, the wicked, and the wolves, and we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to go ahead and cut across here. Do not ride on the sidewalks. Do not ride on the sidewalks. I'm only doing it for this, for the purposes of this episode. We're headed toward the Hôtel de Ville. And this is another building that is an absolute must when you're talking about, oh, illuminated Paris. Look at this with the street lamps. So there is a nasty, disgusting, bizarre story that of course I'm gonna share with you in the Hôtel de Ville. How about I take us over here and we're, I'm gonna set you all down. I'm gonna hop off my bike. Excellent. This square here is where they would have executions. So medieval Paris saw very little preemptive police work. Instead, they chose to make an example out of criminals by executing them in front of the, the, the populace to scare people straight. And the more dramatic and theatrical, the better. And this spot back then known as Place de Grève uh, in front of Hôtel de Ville was the main stage of that disgusting theater of execution. Um, one of the killings was particularly nasty in 1610 when this guy, let me turn on my, my light for you. This guy in 1610 did the unthinkable. He murdered the King of France with a dagger to the heart. The King's name was Henry IV and the assassin here, his name was Ravaillac. Now, there was a specific system back then in 1610 of punishments according to your crime. Um, but they saved the worst, the nastiest for Ravaillac, and this square was packed with Parisians clamoring to watch the show. So the execution of Ravaillac started, they heated up pliers and pincers until they were red hot in the fire, and then they picked away at Ravaillac's flesh. And I gotta warn you, just right now, disclaimer, if you got any kids or squeamish folks watching right now, I should have thrown that out earlier. This is gonna get a little bit graphic, okay, as I describe this, so fair warning, especially for the kids out there. They would pick away at his flesh to open up wounds on his arms, his legs, his chest, his, his calves. And then into those open wounds, they poured molten lead, boiling oil, a scalding mixture of melted pitch and wax and brimstone. And then they tied him to four horses and tore him apart limb by limb. And of course, someone etched that. He was pulled apart by four horses. And they would always choose horses that were, you know, not young and vibrant and would do the, do the trick right away. They actually you know, wanted horses that would take a while and they would pull and tug and it was a slow, as I said, theatrical sort of a, a spectacle. Um, now the idea was basically if you kill our king, you're tearing apart our kingdom and so we are going to literally tear you apart. Now you might think the spectacle would have ended there, but actually they took the body parts of Ravaillac and paraded them through the city, put them on display, and then finally brought them back here to the Hotel de Ville to have them burned and then the ashes were dispersed into the air. So really, really nasty. That was Ravaillac. Every French kid grows up learning about this ultimate enemy of the state who killed Henry IV. Now, there were various iterations of that sort of thing playing out here in the square for generations. And in 1740, they even convicted a cow of sorcery here in front of Hôtel de Ville. They had it publicly hanged. They hanged a cow 
for being a witch, essentially. And then they turned it into a delicious beef bourguignon, and then everyone lived happily ever after. No, I made that part up. Now, after tearing people apart and hanging cows here in Hotel de Ville, they came up with a more civilized idea. In 1792, they said, let's guillotine people instead. Let's just chop off their heads and be all civilized-like. And so it was thus that it happened here, for, actually for the first time in front of the city hall on April 5th, 1792, the first guillotine beheading of the French Revolution. Turns out they quite liked the idea, and France would use this method all the way up to 1977, believe it or not, 1977. But that's... You know, that's another story for another episode. So that's the Hotel de Ville. These guys are loving it. Happy Halloween, everybody. This is a thematic episode, as you can see. And that's the Hotel de Ville. Let me give you another pan before we hop on our bike and get to the next dastardly disgusting story. For whom the bell tolls there. All right, back on the bike. We're gonna cross the river. Here's a view. So let's go ahead and stop here. A couple of cool stories here. This is the Seine River. If you're not familiar with it, I know a lot of you are. And this is a treat because I actually, you know, my daddy duties, we've got two young kids at home. I don't get to hang out uh, after dark like this. So this episode is, a, is quite fun for me. There is a bridge, that next bridge that we can see right here. It fits in perfectly with our theme, our Halloween theme, because it used to be nicknamed the Devil's Bridge. It's technically the Pont Notre Dame. Notre Dame is what we're going to see a little bit later. Why is it called the Devil's Bridge? Because for centuries it had arches Rather than a long expanse here that we're going to see the, this boat pass under, they had several small arches. And the arches um, were so precarious, that basically so perilous for boats, that they had to thread the needle when they were passing through and they would often crash. It was as if the, the bridge itself was devouring those who dared pass beneath it. Add, that, add to that the fact that the currents were particularly strong here, sometimes you know, swirling into these rather diabolical whirlpools under the bridge that would just swallow up sailors and swimmers all, all, all the time. For that reason, it was widely referred to as the Pont au Diable, or the Devil's Bridge. And it was actually named that, the Devil's Bridge, all the way up until they removed the separate arches. You can see on the right and the left, those small arches is what used to span all the way across. And then they just replaced it in the early 1900s with one expanse. And a lot fewer boats crashed. Now here at the Devil's Bridge, it, it created such a... Um, such a spectacle and it was so marked in people's minds that Mr. Victor Hugo himself decided to use this bridge in Les Miserables for fans of, of Les Mis at the end when Javert commits suicide and he jumps off a bridge in Paris into this sort of swirly, frothy abyss. It was meant to be from this bridge that we're looking at, the Pont Notre Dame, aka the Devil's Bridge. I guess you could also, for, for, for that matter, call it the Les Miserables Bridge and that's where Javert jumped to his death. If we just turn around here, you can see, by the way, in the center of your screen is the conciergerie. If you can make that out there. Always lovely. And we're looking at the Hotel Dieu, one of the old, old, old uh, hospitals. In fact, the oldest hospital in town. I want to talk about this quai here, this border. It's called Quai de la Corse. Um, in 1815, take your mind back, boatmen were fishing in the Seine here and pulling up their nets, they found an unholy sight in one of their nets, a severed head that had been sitting decomposing at the bottom of the Seine River. And then to everyone's horror, day after day, other body parts were found spread throughout the city. So the police had the morbid task of putting the pieces together like some kind of uh, bizarre puzzle to see if all the body parts matched up. 
And it turns out they did. And they were able to identify the man in 1815 as a guy called Auguste Dautin. And the police investigated further to learn that their brother, Charles Dautin, had been in a tight spot financially and came knocking on his brother's door asking for, for, for money. And his brother refused, Auguste refused. And of course, you know what the rest of the story was. So clearly, I don't know, it's, it, there's a moral to this story somewhere. Maybe it's, if you're gonna be a policeman or a fisherman, just don't be one in 1815, <laughs> it's, it would, it's, it's gross. So one last look across the river here. Danielle Moulden says, uh, what a stunning, spooky view. So the Devil's Bridge and the head fished out of the Seine, the very bizarre puzzle pieces of Mr. Auguste Dautin. And how about we go check up on Notre Dame. I've got a ghost story to tell you and it's going to be rather even extra spooky because Notre Dame is not lit up anymore because of the construction that's going on. So get on my trusty steed here. I'll take a nice slow ride toward the cathedral. If you're new to this series, I'm a full-time tour guide. My name is Corey Fry. I call myself a French Fry in Paris. I'm a photographer, full-time tour guide here. You can check out how to book a tour with me in Paris in person in the description. I'm a photographer. I got my Instagram account and a live streamer. General all-around Paris content creator is what I am very proud to call myself. So that is the very unilluminated Notre Dame, but I've got a, a fun ghost story to tell you. Now let's get a little bit closer because it's so dark. Pardon? Merci. Sorry. All right, here we go. That's better. So I know some of you like a good juicy ghost story, and here we go. Here's one related to Notre Dame. Again, doesn't it look spooky tonight? Um, imagine it's a cold, drizzly October day in 1882, and a woman approaches the corner here where, just like you can today, um, you could back then climb up to the top and visit the towers. But she was refused entry because women at, at that time had to have a chaperone. They couldn't go up alone. So she befriends a woman down here, an old, an old lady, a stranger, and befriends the lady, offers her you know, to buy her breakfast, and maybe they even ate in this cafe here on the corner, who knows? And then the two of them, these new friends, go all the way up to the top. Well, by then, it was pouring rain. And the old lady takes cover in the, um, in the bell ringer's room. All of a sudden, everybody up on the tower, they hear a blood-curdling scream. And they see the young woman jump to her death. Turns out she had wanted to go up there the whole time to commit suicide. And unfortunately, there's a gate in front of the door at the, at the bottom of Notre Dame. And it cut her body in half and they didn't know who she was and they looked through for identification in her bag and all they found was a handkerchief with the initials MJ. So we refer to this ghost as MJ. And they say sometimes when it's dark and when it's rainy up top on the towers, um, the ghosts of both of those women can be seen sort of flitting, and, uh, flitting around the gargoyles and weaving through the statues up there. The old lady apparently vanished after this story and nobody saw her again. So that's the ghost of the bell tower of Notre Dame. A little bit later in the private tour extension for my Patreon members, um, I'm gonna extend this tour. I'm gonna give them some info about Quasimodo and perhaps the hunchback of Notre Dame is not quite as fictional as we once believed. Perhaps there may have been a real hunchback in Notre Dame. And it's, it's a quite a, a new revelation. And so my Patreon members will get that as a reward. We'll talk about that. I'm gonna get back on my on my bike. <laughs> These streets get very dark and quiet. These are some of the leftover med medieval streets that were never redone when the rest of the boulevards and avenues were put in.
There's another view of Notre Dame here, but again, it's completely dark. It won't, it won't be lit up for a while, I think. Ooh, love this street. A street like this is where it starts to get real spooky. And I'm going to set you down here. We've got this spot all to ourselves. Let's check in with our friends here. Happy Halloween, everybody. So, this is the last spot. So I called this episode The Weird, The Wicked, and The Wolves. And now it's time for The Wolves. The 15th century in Paris saw several particularly cold winters, some that occasionally even turned the Seine River into a solid block of ice, it was so cold. And beyond the stone walls that protected uh, the, the perimeter of the city, there were forests saturated with starving wolves that, were, that faced depleted food sources outside of town. And there were several accounts of times when, when wolf packs snuck through the cracks of the city's borders in search of prey. It happened in 1421, 1438, and infamously in 1450, a year which saw an infiltration that would turn out to be the deadliest of all. That year, an entire pack of wolves entered the city to hunt for food, led by a large, clever, red-haired leader that Parisians eventually would nickname Courteau. Uh, Courteau sort of means bobtail, right? He had a short tail, this wolf. And this, this group, this wolf pack, became known as the Wolves of Paris. 1450. Now, let me tell you about this. During those bone-chilling winter nights of 1450, Courteau and his, his highly organized pack lurked through streets just like this one, um, picking off livestock, stray dogs, and cats. But their hunger wasn't satisfied, so the, the unthinkable began to happen. A child left alone a few minutes too long, a woman heading home through a dark alley, an elderly couple having a late-night stroll. Night after night, Parisians were ambushed and mercilessly devoured by the wolves of Paris. And their cries would echo throughout the city, but by the time anyone arrived for help, it was, it was just too late. Some accounts say that over 40 people were eaten in Paris before the bravest of the city lured the pack in front of Notre Dame, uh, where they were finally slain and paraded through the city. But the story doesn't stop there. The pack's leader, Courteau, uh, had been so intelligent and so methodical, and he had cleverly avoided all of the traps that they laid for him. Rumors spread throughout Paris that it must have been uh, a human transformed a werewolf. And some witnesses even claimed that when they saw the leader, Courteau, um, the wolf had human eyes. So this led to a winter full of frightened and superstitious conversations. And even though the werewolf legend had, had existed throughout Europe for some time, it was really this deadly event that convinced Paris that it could be real. In fact, during the Renaissance period later on, France held the record for werewolf mania, so to speak. In about a hundred year span, there were 30,000 sightings or reports of werewolves in France. 30,000. That's an average of about one werewolf every two days. So to finish the story, the most famous French werewolf was called the, the Beast of Gévaudan. And Gévaudan is a place in, in the sort of the southern part of, of France. And they say that novelists wrote that the, the Beast of Gévaudan, I'll show you here, the king sent out his best hunters, specialists, to kill this quote-unquote werewolf, and novelists later claimed that the beast of Gévaudan was killed by a gun loaded with silver bullets. And so that's one theory of this idea that a silver bullet is required to kill a werewolf. And it was streets just like this in Paris, these dark, dangerous, medieval alleyways where the wolves of Paris had their way with Parisians. So, that is going to conclude the public version of my Halloween-themed episode number 66. I hope you enjoyed it. It's not done yet if you're a Patreon subscriber, and if you want to become a subscriber and get a lot of extra perks, including extensions of my tours, then go ahead and check out the link in the description. Let me show you what I look like. That's me. Well, that's me. And um, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to try to take a look at something here. All right. Well, everybody, I hope you had a great time. Sorry I didn't dress up for the occasion. I could have uh, worn a costume, maybe. 
maybe I'll, you know, I'll do that on another episode. But uh, I hope you had a nice time and I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will catch you on the next one. If you're a Patreon member, just give me a few minutes and I'll switch over to the private tour extension where we're going to talk about more ghosts in this neighborhood. We're going to talk about that Quasimodo hunchback story. Perhaps he was more real than we thought. And we're going to talk about this very bizarre, um, unexpected uh, lady who was found drowned in the Seine. We call her the Mona Lisa of the Seine. And that's a bizarre story as well. And then there's a cafe chat. We're going to talk with a guest. So one more look here. Uh, Hope you have a lovely Halloween, everybody. And I will catch you on the next episode. Take care. Bye-bye.